let's start to add some of the security to our uh, to the example app we've been building. So just by way of quick review, we in the bridge API folder, I've got this REST API that we've been developing. It's really simple. We wrote some tests for it last week. And essentially what we have is we have a little express app and it has an API uh, router here where we're adding all of our bridge routes and we have these bridges routes, which make it possible for our Angular app or any other app to request JSON data um, and get back, you know, get back the results that they need in order to to show show that data in an Angular app or whatever. So what I'd like to do is I would like to add security to this. Right now, anybody can hit these routes, and you know we give out the data. So if you ask for the data, you get the data, and that's really convenient when you are developing locally and when you're trying to get something to work. But when we put this into production we may not want to make this data accessible to everyone. We may want to limit it to a set of users. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to add the ability to have user accounts. I'd like to be able to secure these routes so that it's only possible to request this data if you have been authenticated by the system. And I'm gonna use a bunch of different security techniques to show you how to do this. In the subsequent videos, what I'll do is I'll take the changes that we're gonna make here and I'll layer them into the Angular side so that the app is aware of the security considerations. Okay, so for what I'm gonna build right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into go into my bridge API and I'm going to add a number of modules. So I want to add in a few things. I'm gonna use a really simple in-memory database. So my goal with this talk right now is I, I don't really want to focus on the database. So obviously you could do this in Mongo and I could set this up, you know, to be scaled properly, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to just use a little uh, basic in-memory database uh, to keep things simple. I'm going to use bcrypt for working with passwords to salt and hash those passwords that come in. I'm going to add something called uh, .env, which is going to allow me to safely store secrets and configuration for my for my app. I'm going to add in a couple of modules, Passport and Passport JWT, which I'll be talking about later, and they're going to allow me to set up um, authentication and authorization with Express and also use JSON web tokens. And I'm also going to install JSON the web, Jeb, the JSON web token uh, module as well. So I'll install these things and we can start um, start making use of them. All right. So the thing that I want to start with is I need some concept of users in my system. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I need, I'm going to add a new file to, to my app here. Um, users.js. So inside users.js, essentially what I want to do, like what I want to get to is I want to, I want to make available two different methods. So one of them is the register method and it'll take a username and a full name and a password, and it will register a user. And I also wanna implement some way to check to see whether a given username and password are known to us. So this is like a login, uh, having the ability to log in. And the last thing I'd like to be able to do is if you give me a username, I want to give you back um, a user object. So those are the three things that I want to be able to do. Register a new user, check if a user has the right credentials, and um, return a user from the database. Okay, so some real quick setup stuff. So first thing, 
I'm going to use this Loki database. And this database, I've never used it before doing this demo, but I just wanted a really simple in-memory database. And this is just, it's perfect. It's not production grade. You wouldn't use this for anything other than a demo probably, but for my purposes, it's really good. So I'm going to create a, I'm going to create a, a Loki database to hold my user information. So I'll pull in the Loki.js module. And I'm also going to pull in uh, bcrypt so that I can work with it. And then let's set up our database. So set up the DB. So I'm going to have a user's collection, which is only going to be available once I've opened the database or connected to the, the database. And the first time that I run this, I'm not going to have a database, so it's going to have to get created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I have a database. It's equal to new Loki. I'll, I'll put it in a file, data.db. And then there's some options that I can give. So when I create um, a new database, there's a bunch of different things I can do. Like I can tell it I want it to auto save the data from memory to disk. Um, I want it to automatically load the data uh, when it starts. Uh, I want to I want to have a callback function run when the data is loaded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so for our purposes, what I'll do is I'll say auto load is true. So if the database exists, load it, and auto load callback is I want it to run this function here. And basically, I want to get the user's collection. So the way this database works is you have a database, and then the database can have these collections. Um, so I want to get like I want to have a user's collection essentially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that users is equal to db dot get collection users. So if if it's the first time that I run this, that won't exist. So if that's the case then I'm going to have to say db dot uh, add collection users. And I'm also going to specify um, some options for this thing. I'm going to say that um, I want the username field to be unique. So two people can't have the same username. So this should take care of loading in my, my user's data when this starts. I'm also just going to add a couple other things. I want it to automatically save the data from memory because it's an in-memory database which gets persisted to disk. And I want the autosave uh, interval to be something like every five seconds, something like that. And I have my, uh, it's unhappy with this. I'll come back to this. Okay. so. Um, what is it unhappy with? Oh, it's just taking time to catch up. Okay. So now we have a database and we can register um, a new user. So let's think about this. <clears throat> let's say that our users look like this. So a user has, um, they have a username, you know, whatever it is, Dave full name, so like a display name, and a password um, that's going to go in. And <clears throat> we're not going to actually store the password. We're going to hash it, salt and hash it. But we have the ability to store some sort of a hash for, uh, for this user's password. OK, so let's think about this. So step one would be, if you want to register a new user, I would need to check. OK, so check if this username already exists. So step one would be check if it already exists. And if it doesn't exist, then create a new um, create a new user. These are the things that I need to be able to do. OK, so I'm going to st let's start with this one. So we'll say if users dot find one uh, username. So look up the username and see if we have a user. So if we have a user, 
Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw a new error and I'm gonna say um, username already registered. <clears throat> so I can't, I can't put another one in because we already have a username in there for that particular user. So if we don't, then we're gonna create a new user and creating a new user, we're also going to um, hash their password. Okay, so in order to hash this user's password, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, um, I need to generate a hash and I'm gonna use bcrypt.hash and I'm gonna I'm gonna do their um, hash their password, and then I have to tell it <clears throat> how many how much work to do. So as we discussed in a previous video, bcrypt allows us to slow things down so that um, depending on your hardware, you can make sure that it's expensive to generate this hash. We don't want it to be super fast but there's a trade-off. I don't want it to be so slow that people think that the, the server isn't working. Now, the thing is, because this is gonna take a while to do, I have to be careful. I don't want it to block the main thread here. So I'm gonna use the uh, promise-based version or the async version of this. So I'm gonna say that my function is asynchronous. And <clears throat> here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna await the bcrypt hash uh, when it comes back. Now, the question becomes, what should I put here for the amount of work that I'm gonna do for bcrypt? Because bcrypt takes the number of rounds, essentially, um, that it, you know the factor that it needs to use when it's calculating the salt and hash here. And we could hard code a number in here, but instead of doing that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a configuration file. So in my app, I'm going to create a new file called .env. So the module that I'm gonna to use to do this is .env and the way that it works is you, at the very beginning of your program, you tell .env to essentially read in your environment file or read in variables from the environment. And the environment file needs to look like this. It's just a bunch of key value pairs. This equals this. It's like an INI file if you've ever looked at those on Windows and so on. And so you can put your configuration information in your ENV. And then in your program, you can use process.environment. and whatever the variable is that you want to want to work with. So for me, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define um, in my ENV, I wanna keep track of how many uh, salt rounds to use with. <clears throat> I'm looking to go about one second of work. And so this is a comment in an ENV file. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say salt rounds equals 14. So, Whenever I put these things in here, you don't have to do it, but it's a convention that you put them all in capitals like this. And you'll also see that I'm using snake case to, to name this, which is again, just sort of a convention that is out there. So I'm gonna save this in my .env file. Now, the reason I'm doing it out here is because it makes it possible for me to deploy this server on another machine, which has different hardware, and I need to tune it. So instead of having to modify my code, I can just modify the environment. You typically don't put the ENV into Git or you don't have it in source control. I'll come back to that when we talk about secrets, but for now I'm just gonna have the salt rounds in here. So one other change that I need to make before I can do anything else is that the entry point for my program right here, I need to do, I need to do this, I need to, um, start out by reading in my environment using .env. So I'll save this and um, back over here, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna say const uh, salt rounds is equal to process.env.saltrounds, 
like that. Now, the way that env variables work is that they're strings. So you have to be really careful here because we put uh, in our env, we have 14, like so. But it's going to come over here and it's not going to be a number. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that to a number. There's a bunch of ways you could do this, but I'll just convert this to a number. Now, what's going to happen is I'll just show you here. So if I um, if I were to say um, 14 and I convert this to a number, so this is now a numeric 14 like this. If I had nothing, so if it was undefined, I would get back not a number. Okay. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with the fact that this may not be here. So if they don't give me, if there's nothing in the environment that's specified for this, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to default to 10. So I'll say if you if you haven't specified this and there's nothing there, I get back not a number or I get back null or undefined or whatever, then I'm going to use 10. So then down here, I'm going to say salt rounds. I'm going to use my variable in order to calculate in order to calculate my hash. Okay, so this will take some time. It's going to calculate the hash. And once I do this, I can then um, insert this into the database. So I'm going to grab the user's collection. I'm going to insert into the user's collection an object. So I'm going to input the username field. I'm going to put in the full name field. And I'm also going to put in the hash like so. So that's what my user object will look like when it gets put into the database. OK, so let's what else can we what else can we do here? We need to go in the other direction. We need to take a username and a password and we need to figure out whether or not this is this is real. OK, so do we know about this user? So step one would be check if this user is in the database. And if the user is not in the database, then or if they are in the database, then I'm going to um, calculate a new hash and compare to the database version. So if somebody logs in and they log in with a password, I should be able to hash that password and I should get the same hash that was generated up here when the user registered. So I'm not going to store the password. I'm going to store the hash, the salted hashed version of that is going to go in my database. Okay, so step one, check if the user is in the database. So we're going to say, similar to what we did up here, I'm going to say if uh, actually, const, let's grab the user by their username and then do a check. If, um, if the user doesn't exist, then I need to do, I need to error. Okay, now what are my options for erroring here? I could throw, I could throw and say, um, Whoops. So I could throw an error that says, I don't know who this user is. Like this person doesn't exist in our database. However, um, I, wanna, I wanna do it in a different way because, and I'll show you why. So down here, I wanna calculate this new hash. And up here we said that bcrypt takes time to work. So I, when I'm gonna generate a new hash and compare it to an existing hash, that's also gonna take a bunch of time. So I'm gonna need to I'm gonna need to use the promised version of this. So I'm gonna need to await this. So one thing I could do is I could say that this is an asynchronous function, and so that's gonna allow me to throw. That's fine. And down here I could say something like um, const. Um, is valid. So is the password valid is equal to await bcrypt um, dot compare. And I'm going to compare the, the current password that I've been passed with the user's hash that was put in the database right here when they registered. So this is going to return true or false. And then over here, I'm going to say return is valid, like so. 
So let's clean this code up slightly because if you look at this code, I'm basically creating a variable that I only use in order to return it. So if you ever see yourself doing this, you don't need a variable. What we could do is we could just say return like that. So we're, we're gonna return the result of this promise. So remember that, that when we have a wait, it means that this returns a promise. But to be honest, what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna bother awaiting it here. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna return the promise and I'm gonna let the caller await the result. So I, I don't need to, I don't care what the result is. I don't care if it's true or false. I just wanna give it back to the caller and the caller is gonna figure out what to do with it. So because I'm returning a promise and I'm not awaiting, I don't actually need async. Because I don't need async, I have to be careful because I now have two different versions of code that are inside this, this function. I've got, I've got a throw and I've got something returning a promise. But if you wanna return a failed promise, then you shouldn't throw. Instead, what you should do is you should return a rejected promise, return promise.reject like this. So now this, let's just be clear. So this returns a promise and the promise is either going to be a reject, it's gonna be immediately rejected with an error because there's no user in the database or it's going to return a promise that has a value of true or false depending on whether or not um, <clears throat> whether or not this user's password matches the one that's in the database that we have. Okay, so we got one more function to write. If you give me a username, I want to get back the, um, I want to, I basically want to return to you users.find1 based on their username like that. So give me a username, I'll give you back the full user object. And I think, let's clean this up. I think that should do it. Let's, let's try using it. So it doesn't like this, so what am I missing? I'm missing a parenthesis. Okay, that seems same to me. So now we could move on and we could try and use this. So what I want to do at this point is I want to modify I want to modify my code so that the way that the web server works right now, I have an API uh, root endpoint where all my all my APIs live. And what I want to do, I'm going to add another one. So I'm going to I'm gonna pull in a new module which doesn't exist yet and so I'm gonna to need to write it, but I'm gonna pull in an authorization router. And this authorization router, it's going to, I'm gonna basically do the same thing, app.use, but I'm gonna hang it off of auth instead of API. So I'll separate my authentication and my API parts. You could put them together, like that's fine too, but I'm just gonna do them in, in a slightly different way so I can do that in two different, two different files and keep them kind of separate from each other. Okay, so I need, to, I need to write this file. So I need a new, um, a new file here, auth, whoops, right here, I need a new file, auth.js. And this thing is gonna be very similar to what we're doing over here. So let me just, I'll start with this because it's close to what we want. So I need to essentially do this. I need to um, make a router and return the router back. Now let's think about the routes that we want. I want to be able to register a new user and I want to be able to uh, log in as an existing user. So those are the two things that I want to be able to do. Register a new account, log in on an existing account. Now in both those cases, I'm going to be needing to send username, password, etc., that kind of information. So I'm not going to use a get request 
when I do that because I don't want that data to go on the URL. I don't want to send my, um, I don't want to put my password on the URL. I would rather embed it in the body of the request. So I'm going to do post instead of get. So we can, we can stub out these two routes. So our router is going to have a post route for registering a user. And we're going to have to do request response like that. And we're also going to need to be able to uh, log in with an existing existing account. Okay. So because my registration and my login is going to need that users database, that users module, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in, I'm going to pull in users. So I'll say const users is equal to, I'll pull in users like so. Okay, so let's think about how we're going to do this. So when the data gets posted to us, the username, full name, and password needs to get sent on the body of the request. So we're going to do a post, a post request, and it's going to be on the body. So let's start out by pulling off the username, the full name, and the password from the body of the request. Now, if somebody hits this route, and they don't send the proper information, we need to complain. So right away, we need to tell them this is a this is um, a bad request. You can't do this. So I'm going to do a check right away and say if I don't have username and full name, whoops, and password, Then what I want to do is I immediately want to return a response with a status code of 400. So recall from your HTTP status codes, we want 200s are at work, 300s are redirects, 400s are client errors. And so we basically want to say like, you know, this, this request that you made it is not acceptable. Um, We, you know, basically we're not gonna we're not gonna allow it. And I'll send back a JSON message which says um, that you're missing you're missing required user information. Okay, so that's step one. Get the data from the post from the post, and then we use the data from the post in the next step. Make sure that the make sure the data is there that that we can we can work with it. Okay. The next thing that I want to try and do is I want to try and call this register method. So what I have to do, I'm calling, so it's async, which means it's going to return a promise. So I'm going to have to either deal with the promise or I'm going to have to await this thing coming back. I'm going to have to pass in a username, a full name and a password and it, it's either going to work or it's going to fail here. So let's, let's try this. So because I want to work with asynchronous function calls in here that I want to await, I'm going to I'm going to mark that this is an asynchronous function that I'm in, which is going to allow me to write a try catch like so, so that I can try doing uh, the registration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to await users dot register and I'm going to pass in the username, the full name and the password. So that'll take some time because it has to generate the hash and it has to put it in the database and it'll eventually come back. And if it works, I'm going to end up right here. So if that's the case, I'm going to send back a response with a status code of 201. So 201 here means that we've created um, we've created your object that you expected. So we're going to do a 201 and we're going to say message would be uh, created user username, something like that. 
Now, if we run this and it fails, so why would it fail? Well, over here you can see, for example, uh, what if they give us a duplicate username? So if they give us, a, if we get a username that we have seen in the past and is already registered in the database, then we're gonna get an error and it's gonna say that the user already exists um, or the bcrypt function could fail. Any number of things could go wrong here. So we're gonna have a catch here that's gonna deal with the case of an error. And so I'm gonna say uh, response.status. So I'm gonna say if, I, if, this, if, if I couldn't create this and um, like the username was already taken or something like that, I'm gonna give you a 400 back and I'm gonna say, um, message unable to create username. And then I'll give you the error is going to be whatever the error I get back dot message. So take the string off this error object and stick it on the stick it on the response. So it's either going to work or it's going to fail. It could fail for a number of reasons or it'll work and then we'll have a, a user in the database. Okay, that's perfect. Now let's do the login case. So when a user logs in, I want them to give me a username and a password. So we're gonna do same kind of thing. We're gonna grab the username off the body of the request. And I need to spell this correctly. So now we do the same sort of dance. If we don't have a username and a password, then we're going to return a 400 and we're gonna say the message will be missing required login information. Okay, so we know that we have the right value. And now what we want to do is we want to try calling our login function. So let's just take a look at login again. So what login does, or not login, and we called it check. Check takes a username and a password and it returns a promise. And the promise will fail if there's no user in the database with that username or it'll send back a promise which will return true or false depending on whether the password that was given is equal to the hash that is stored in the database. So we need to call this check and we need to do so asynchronously. So I'm gonna mark this function async like so. And uh, what do we have to do here? We need to do another try catch. Really important to do the try catch because if you don't, if you do an asynchronous, if you call an asynchronous function, something that returns promise and you await it, but you don't wrap it in a try catch, then if it, if it fails, it'll blow up your program because you'll have this unhandled uh, or this unhandled rejection for promise rejection and the program, like, it's just gonna keep pushing it up the stack. Eventually it's gonna to get to the top and blow up. So it's really important that you deal with your errors. Uh, let's do this. Okay, here's our structure. So what do we need to do? So we are going to say, we're gonna await users.check. We're gonna take the username and the password that were passed to us on the body. And we're gonna do a check. And it's gonna return, it's gonna do one of two things. It's gonna, if it fails, it's gonna land down here inside of the error callback. So why don't we just do that right away? So if it fails, I'm gonna send back status and I'll say message unable to authenticate username, and I'll give you an error. Um, 
error will be error.message, like so. Okay, so then we're gonna say up here, if it works, we're gonna check and see um, if is if not is valid. So if the password is not valid, then I'm gonna return back a, a response with a status of 401. So I'm gonna give you back an unauthorized response. So here's a 401 and the JSON is message login failed. Like so. However, if it works, then we're gonna send back a 200 and messages login was successful and let's just leave it at that for now. Login was successful. Okay, this is good. So let's let's give this a try. So I am going to spin up this server. Okay, the server is running. So I'm going to I'm going to open up another shell up here and I'm going to I'm going to work with um I'm going to use the curl command. So if I curl um if I curl uh local host 3000 you can see that I get a response back from the server. So the server gives me a 404 because there's nothing there. Um but if I were to curl slash API slash bridges, you can see that I get down here, my web server gave me back a 200 on API bridges. And up here, I've got all my all my, my bridge data. And if I were to do that and pipe that into JQ, JQ lets me, um, it, it lets you work with, with uh, JSON data. Okay, so, so this server is working, but what I really wanna do is I wanna test the parts of my server for registering and um, working with users. And, um, okay, so let's just do a test. So I should be able to, well, let's try logging in first of all. So there's no, there are no accounts in this uh, database at all. So I wanna, I wanna log in. So I'm gonna use curl and I'm gonna, when, when you do curl, um, it, curl will, you can tell curl you want it to run silently. So um, it so it won't print out extra information when it's waiting, like when it's doing, when there's like um, download progress. So I'm gonna do, so my command is gonna be curl s for silent. And the way that you post data to the server with curl is you do, you do dash d or dash dash data and you can also tell it to URL encode the data. So if, you're, if your data has uh, spaces in it or something like that, you can send data along, um, you know, just to see, like, so that, it'll, so that it, it, it will properly be encoded um, the way it would be if you were doing this from a, a form. So let's do this. Let's pass in uh, username equals, equals Dave. And also I'm gonna data URL encode um, password equals secret one, two, three. So I'm gonna send username and password up to the server and I need to send it to the right place. So I'm gonna send it to localhost 3000 slash auth slash register. So you can see what just happened. So down here, my web server shows me that there was a post that came in to auth register. So this function right here, and you can see that it hit, it, it got back a 400 and you can see the messages uh, missing required user information. So let's figure out why 
username and password. So I'm falling in here. Why am I falling in here? Okay, I was looking at this and wondering what was going on, but it's actually doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So I was hitting register and not login. Let me do login for a second. So I'm gonna tell it uh, to hit login. So I wanna send username equal Dave, password equals secret123 to localhost3000 auth login. And when I do that, I get back an error. Uh, oh, this is interesting. You can see that I actually have an error coming from my uh, database from my user's code. Cannot read property, find one of undefined. Uh, find one users. Uh, let me just look at this for one second. Yeah, so I am missing an O right here. So it's not ever firing that callback. Let me restart my server. And let's try that again. Okay, that's better. So if I do this and I send it through. So what's happening here is I'm getting a 400 back. I get a 400 back that says um, it's unable to authenticate Dave because Dave is an unknown user. Now, if I did the same thing, but let's say I, I didn't send a password. Um, so if I don't put a password in, I fall into this 400 here where it says um, you're missing login information. Okay, so let's try and actually register a user. So what I would do is I would say curl and I would say data URL encode so I have to pass in a bunch of things. Username equals Dave. Um, password equals uh, secret123. Um, full name equals David Humphrey. And then we're gonna hit localhost 3000 auth register. So I should fall in here and this should create a new user for me. Now you see how it took, it took a bit of time to work, like it took more than a second because bcrypt had to hash my password for me and it comes back and it said created user Dave. So now if we, um, let me see if I can uh, do, if I send my data, uh, I'm not in the right directory, uh, repos, cd, um, yeah, there's, okay, so if I, data.db, so here's my database file. Let's see if we can find, okay, here's my user record right here. So inside my database, a new file has been created, data.db, which is here. And you can see that when I look at it, the username, full name, and then the hashed password are all stored inside here for this user, like that. Okay, so what if I try and register that same user again? So if we look over here, if I try and do this, it should fail because we have, it'll be a duplicate user. So it comes back, you can see down here, I have a 400 instead of a 201. And it says it was unable to create this user, the username already exists, it's already registered. So that's working, that's good. Okay, so now let's see if I can log in. So logging in, uh, let me clear this. Okay, so if I log in, all I need to do is get rid of the full name. 
So I want to send in my username and password to auth login. And that should hit this route here. And that worked. You can see my login was successful. And down here I have a 200. Uh, I have a 200 that the login worked. Now, if I try and log in and I have the wrong password, so let's say I, my password is, is different somehow. Login failed, I get a 401 like so. So that's good. Um, okay, this is excellent. So at this point, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause because the next piece of work that we have to do is um, pretty involved and it's going to require us to take this user infrastructure and start using it with Passport and working with JSON Web Tokens. So I'll pause it there and in the next video I'm going to tackle how we will use this in order to do secure tokens that we can share with, uh, with REST APIs.